Thank you. So I'm Asaf, and I talk about Flash Shield, the hybrid key value cache that controls flash write amplification. This is joint work with Ryan Statsman, who sits here, and with colleagues from Stanford and MIT. So key value caches today are a crucial layer in modern web applications. And the architecture usually is that you have a web server, and when you try to access an object, you first access the cache, like memcached. And only if the object is not there, you access a slower, persistent database, like MySQL. The caches usually sit in a separate cluster, and they use DRAM to store the, their data. The reason caches are important is because they are faster, and also they reduce the load on the database. The hit rates are usually capacity bounded, and the hit rates are also what determines the performance. So these caches are, the, the performance of these caches is determined by how many objects they can serve. So I mentioned that these cache, caches use DRAM to store their data, and the question is why DRAM? We know that SSDs are widely used in data centers today, and they are very attractive because they are an order of magnitude cheaper compared with DRAM. And we know that companies like Facebook and Google use, use SSDs widely in their data centers for databases like LevelDB and RocksDB that are optimized for Flash. So surprisingly, Flash is not used, is almost never used for key value caches, even though key value caches, as I mentioned, they are capacity bounded and SSD is much cheaper. And you may think that the reason for that is latency, but actually, the, because these caches are accessed over the network, the, la the required latency is the same order of magnitude as the latency of the device. So latency is also not, it's not the reason why we don't use SSD. And actually, the common reason is the SSD durability. And by durability, I mean that we can only write a very limited number of times per location on flash. And in and key value caches, they have these characteristics that they evict very frequently and they also allocate very frequently, so they incur many writes. And that's not all, and actually it's much worse because Flash also suffers from write amplification. And write amplification is the ratio between the number of bytes that are written by the application, cache in our case, and the number of bytes that are written by the device. So for example, if the cache writes one byte, but the device would actually have to write 10 bytes, the write amplification is 10. So why we have this write amplification in Flash? Unfortunately, the writes and the lists and the deletes in Flash are not symmetric. So let, let's see how it works. Imagine that this is the Flash and the squares that we see here are the flash blocks, which are the smallest unit that can be erased. And these blocks consist of pages, which are these yellow squares, and this is the smallest unit that can be written. So we, for example, we want, we look at this block and we want to update this blue page. We can't just overwrite it because in flash, unfortunately, we can't overwrite data but instead we have to delete first the entire block and then we copy all the pages to an, we copy first all the pages to another way we to another place we delete the entire block and then we have to rewrite all the pages again including the updated blue page so we ran an experiment on an ssd with write counters that can that let us calculate the write amplification and what we see here is the, the y-axis is the device write amplification, the x-axis is the flash utilization, and on the left side we use random writes, and the right side we use sequential writes. And the different lines here represent different segment sizes. And the important takeaway here is that if we want to reduce the write amplification, we have to write in large segments in the order of megabytes. So now the question is, can we just write in larger segments to reduce write amplification? So we collected a week-long trace 
from a company called Memcacheer, which pro provides Memcached as a service. And we noticed that the average object size is only 257 bytes. So that means that even if we allocate lots of objects together in a large segment, when we will try to evict the segment, some of the objects would probably be cold, but some of them would also be hot. And then in order to maintain the cache eviction policy, we would want to rewrite all these hot objects again to the flash. So we simulated two of the current systems that use flash for caching, for caching key val value data, uh, RIPQ and victim cache. And as you can see, the cache level write amplification is significant. So that led us to design Flash Shield, a cache that uses both DRAM and Flash. And our goal was to, to have comparable performance to DRAM caches, but with more than 10 times lower cost. And we do it by minimizing the write amplification. And one of the key insights we had is that not all objects in the cache are Flash worthy, or what we call flashy. So in, instead of writing all objects to the flash, we always write them first to the DRAM and then they have to prove their flashiness before they are written to the, to the flash. Ideally, flash items are items that are immutable, which means they are, they are not going to be updated soon. And also they are frequently read in the, in the near future, which means they are not going to be evicted soon. And now the, the question is how we can predict uh, uh, which objects are flash worthy. So we tried different te techniques and apparently it's not easy to come with a fixed threshold that, that is good enough for all the application. And also we tried uh, to use policies like uh, least recently used or uh, least frequently used, but also apparently it's very hard to use these policies as an admission policy to flash. So instead what we do is we use machine learning to learn which objects are flashy for each application. And for this we define flashiness as whether the object will be read more than n, more than n times in the future. And n here is a configurable parameter that can indicate how much we are sensitive to write amplification. So for example, if we are very sensitive to write amplification, we can set n to a larger, uh, a larger number and if we are more sensitive to heat rates, we can set n to a lower number. And we, we use a binary classifier, SVM, support vector machine. And the two <coughs> features that we found the most impactful are the number of past reads per object and the number of past updates. And just to give you an idea, this is the accuracy that, uh, that we got. So the y-axis is the accuracy, and the x-axis here is the is different values of n. And the important takeaway here is that the accuracy is between 75% to 100%. The different lines represent different applications in Memcacheer. So, so far, we talked about DRAM as a filter but we also use DRAM f uh, in, in a flash yield as a caching layer for objects that has not proven themselves as flash yet. And we also use it to store the index of objects that resides either in the flash or in the DRAM. So let's see how the, how the cache works. As I mentioned, we always allocate new objects to the DRAM first. And once they are allocated, we start collecting features about them. We have a cleaner running in the background that once in a while, when we have enough flashy items in DRAM, we'll trigger, an, uh, we'll trigger a segment allocation, we'll, and it will create this segment of flashy items, and we'll flush it to the SSD device. We have a global eviction queue that is shared between DRAM and flash. And if we want to evict items from the DRAM, we can just delete them. But if we want to evict items from the flash, we don't just delete them because it will 
increase write amplification, so instead we mark them as ghosts, and they will be deleted wh only when we evict the entire segment. And segments are evicted in FIFO order, and when we do it, so ghost items are deleted, and objects that are not ghosts are rewritten to DRAM when they have to prove their flashiness again. So let's quickly see how it all works together. When we allocate an item, it first goes to the DRAM and enters the eviction queue. It may trigger the evictions of other items. And we have a cleaner running in the background. And once we have enough flashy items in the DRAM, it will create a, se a segment and will allocate it to the flash. Eventually, the flash will fill up with segments. And then we will have to evict a segment from the fl flash in FIFO order. And then ghost items are deleted, and non-ghost items are rewritten back to DRAM, where they have to prove their flashiness again. OK, so we talked about DRAM as a filter and DRAM as a cache. And, and we also, as I mentioned, we use DRAM to store the index of, of the items that are either in flash or DRAM. And the, the reason we keep the index in DRAM is first because of write amplification. If we would have to update the eviction queue uh, position, for example, every time, it will increase write amplification significantly, and also because of the latency. If we use the naive approach for storing the index, which means that we will store the item location in the flash and the eviction queue position in the flash, of the item in the flash, and we will also keep the entire key in the index. So th that would take at least 17 bytes per item, and that would take up or exceed the, our DRAM. So instead, we use a, an efficient index, uh, index where we, that will take less than four bytes per item, and we do it by, instead of using LRU, we use the clock algorithm, which is a, an approxim a good, very good approximation for LRU. We don't keep the exact location of the item in the, in the flash, and instead we only keep the segment ID where the object resides, and we also keep an ID of a predefined hash function that provides us the entry point inside this segment. We don't keep the keys at all in the index. Instead, we use, a, we use Bloom filters, and we have a, a separate Bloom filter for each segment that can, can indicate whether the key resides in the segment. So let's run through an example to see how, how we allocate a segment. So we have a list of flashy items that is sorted according to f flashiness. And we start with the first item. So we hash the key of this item, and we get an entry point in the segment. We see that it can fit here. So we just put it here, and we keep the hash ID in the index. And then we continue to the next item. We hash the key. We get this entry point in the segment. But this time, we see that it overlaps with the previous object. So what we do, we use the next predefined hash function. By default, we have eight hash functions that we can try. <coughs> and this time, we get this entry point, and it fits. So we put it here, and we update the index with the, with the right hash function ID. And we continue this way for all the, the items until there are no more flashy items or until the segment is full. And for some items, we, might, we may try all the eight hash functions and, and see that we can't fit it in, into the segment. And in that case, we will just skip the item and, and we'll try to allocate it in the next se segment. And eventually, we get something like that. So you see that there are some white gaps, which, uh, which are places where we couldn't fill any objects. And that means that the utilization of the segment is not necessarily 100% we use, because we use these predefined hash functions. So apparently, this, 
this utilization of the segment is a function of how many candidates we have when we trigger the segment allocation. And, and we ran a study, and what we see here is the, the results when the y-axis is the se segment utilization, the x-axis is the total candidate data considered. And you can see that when we try to allocate a segment of 512 megabytes, if we have one gigabyte of the data considered, the utilization is all, almost 100%. And because we don't keep the keys in the DRAM, let's see how we add new items to the lookup table, how we deal with collisions. So we hash the key to get an entry inside the lookup table, and we see that it, there is, it, this entry is free, so we just put the item here, and then we allocate the, we update the corresponding bloom filter that the key resides in this segment. Then we continue to the next object. We hash the key. We get this entry, but we, we see that this entry is already occupied. So what we do is we try the next hash function, and we see that this entry is, is free, so we allocate it here and update the bloom filter. And now when we do lookups, so we again, we hash the key, but, and we get this entry, but we don't know whether the, the, this is really the object that we are looking for, or maybe we have a hash collision. We don't have the key, so we can't know for sure, and instead we go to the corresponding bloom filter, and we see whether the key exists. In this case, the bloom filter indicates that the key exists, but we still don't know for sure, because bloom filters may also have false positives. So we go to the flash device and we validate the key before we read the object, and in this case we see that it's really a hit. Now let's see the last example. We hash a key, we get the corresponding segment ID, we check the, in the bloom filter whether it's the right key, and it, this time the bloom filter indicates that it, the key doesn't reside in, in this segment, so we know it's just a hash collision, and then we try the next predefined hash function, we get this entry, we see in the bloom filter that it exists, we compare it with the key in flash, and we see that it's the right key. So we ran flash yield and compared it with RIPQ and victim cache, and what we see here are the hit rates and the cache level write amplification for different applications in memcacheer. And you can see that the hit rates are very similar between the three, the three caches, but the cache level write amplification is significantly lower in flash yield with a median of only 0 0.5. So to summarize, we, we talked about uh, flash yield and SSD, we show that SSD faces unique challenges to its adoption as a key value cache because of durability. Flash Shield uses a lightweight machine learning profiling to predict, to predict which objects are the best fit for Flash. It utilizes a novel, a novel in-memory index for variable sized items, which take like less than four bytes per item. <coughs> and Flash Shield re eventually reduces the right ampli amplification significantly with a median of 0 0.5 in the memcacheer traces that we ran, which is at least six times better than other existing systems. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Any question from the audience? Yes. Thanks for the talk. So you mentioned about the machine learning algorithm as a filter. What kind of machine learning uh, model are you using, and how much objects are rejected uh, so from sorry, so the flash? So the question was, what kind of machine learning learning we use? Yeah, and uh, how many? What's the percentage of, of objects are rejected from inserting to flash? Yeah, so good question. So 
I mentioned that we, so we, we tried the uh, first logistic, uh, like we, we tried to, to, to predict first how many times the object will be read in the future. And apparently it's, it was very hard to predict the exact number. And that's why we use a binary classification. So we use SVM for that. And we, 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 we have a, a parameter of, of, of how many times the, the object will be read in the future. And then what we try to, to predict is whether the object will be read more than this parameter in the future. So it's a binary classification a supervised, uh, with a supervised learning. And uh, one of the interesting things we, we noticed is that in Mem Memcashier, more than 60% of the objects that are written to the cache are not, are not read in the future. So uh, the majority of, of the items are actually not flash worthy. So it, it does, is that, does it answer your question? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, hello. So I was wondering which features are you uh, considering when you decide uh, whether the object should be uh, cacheable or not? Which features are you looking? Yeah, so we, we, we looked at many features. And surprisingly, the two features that are the most impactful are how many it are, are just two, how many times the object was read in the past, and how many times the object was updated in the past. We tried a bunch of other features, like the frequency, the frequency of reads, and, uh, and lots of others. We also discussed it in the paper a little bit. And, uh, but the correlation was sometimes even negative, or usually we didn't see any correlation, so we used this feature with, which has the highest impact. Thank you. Uh, one final question. Um, your initial motivation is to try to motivate, I guess, real-world applications to use SSDs uh, instead. Do you have any end-to-end -end metrics to motivate that, that decision, like how much do you affect the end to end, you know, the lifetime of the of the of the flash? What's the impact on latency throughput, uh, or you know, even the cost benefit of if I have to have a, a smaller one or a larger one with less cost? What does it affect the, bo the bottom line of the of the application? So our goal is to to reduce the cost in an order of magnitude, which means at least ten times cheaper when we we use the hybrid key, key value cache. Uh, it's. Do you have a notion of how, how close you get to that, to that goal? Yeah, so we, we, we at least for Memcache here, we were able to reduce the cost by 10. We even saw the calculation of the cost in the, in the paper. Uh, and the, the performance, because, we, because the discussions run over the network, so the performance is, is comparable to, to Durham. We, we showed that the hit rates are almost identical to what we have with uh, key value caches that are stored in, in Durham. So the, per, so the performance is, is, uh, is per comparable, but with much, much, much lower cost. Sorry, nice uh, in one of your slides, you, you talk about your motivation uh, because you need a DRAM of 406 gigabyte, which is very expensive. Can you go back, back to that slide? I think there might be a typo or... Yeah, yeah, we, talk, we, we give an example of... of uh, Should that of be 400 megabytes? Does that affect your conclusion or does if, that affect your motivation? What? How much? Because I think that your calculation should be 400 megabytes, not 400 gigabyte. If you go back to that slide, when talk about, because too big to fit in the DRAM. When you talk uh, about motivation. 17 bytes times 25 megabyte, meg, sorry. You mean, let's Very beginning. This one? Yes, okay. the last line, should that be 400 gig megabyte? Or is that a typo or that something, does that affect your motivation or conclusion? The, the last one, the last line? Yeah. So it's 17 bytes per item. And we assume we have 25 yeah, know, million so items in the cache. That should be 406 megabyte, not a gigabyte. So does that affect anything, or is that a typo? Yeah, so the number of, I believe, I believe the number of items here maybe is, is not 25 megabytes. It's 25, yeah, it's uh, like giga, giga items. OK, thank it's you. But a good catch. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you.